There are a select few who can lay claim to being part of the Beatles' inner circle. Fewer still had substantial careers outside of that circle in modeling, art, and fashion. Jenny Boyd is one of them. Her sister, fellow fashion model Patty Boyd, was married to Beatle George Harrison. Jenny, of course, would become friends with the Beatles and be deeply involved with the group's interest in transcendental meditation and, like her sister, served as a muse for music that's stood the test of time. Well, all of this is recounted in her new book, Jennifer Juniper, A Journey Beyond the Muse. Jenny Boyd, welcome to the show. Thank you. In your book, you talk about your friendships with the Beatles and Donovan and Mick Fleetwood, who you eventually married. And I bet there are young girls listening to this right now thinking to themselves, boy, I don't meet anybody but these Boyd sisters, you know, <laughs> <laughs> was it just a case of, listen, it was swinging London, we were beautiful young people, and we just all happened to be in the yeah, thick of it? Yeah, and it was, you know, it was a particular time, and uh, as I say in my book, you know, it's like I had a particular look that was exactly what that time was um, was about, and I think it was, you know, a way of thinking and a way of being that was very different to how it is now. And it just so happened. I mean, I didn't plan to be a model, uh, although my sister was a model. I was still at school. But then I got headhunted, and I kind of fell into the modeling thing, so we're both models. And then we were both in the music world, because she was with George, and I was with Mick Fleetwood, my boyfriend, who was then later part of Fleetwood Mac. And, and, um, and it was just, we had lots of similarities, and we were very close. And then, so, you know, we went to India together because uh, George and Patty knew that I was a seeker as well. And so we all went to India together for three months or so. And, you know, there were a lot of things that we did that were the same. Before that, I'd spent time in San Francisco without realizing that flower power and everything like that was about to start. So it was just being in this extraordinary or in these pivotal places at these pivotal times at times where we never knew all those years later that we would be looking back on these times and saying how extraordinary they were. There were so many people who were still very, very into the Beatles and as they were, you know, when you signing books and they chat to you, and so many of them, all different ages from all over the world, so many of them were saying, oh, I wish I lived in the 60s. I wish I lived in the 60s, you know, it's just like all of them just had this thing about the 60s and the Beatles, and it was, um, it was, it was really lovely. And right around that time, you also worked in the Apple Boutique, did you not? I did. So for people who are listening to this and don't know, the Beatles and Apple Records opened up their own clothing store in the heart of London, which had a very beautiful mural painted outside by a, a Dutch a group of artists called The Fool, and they sold all of these, uh, well, psychedelic clothes. And after a while, the uh, the neighborhood complained, and that mural had to be painted over, and then eventually the, uh, the, the store was shut down. Yes, yes, because nobody had ever seen anything like that before. It was very conservative in many ways. And so um, to ha do something so outrageous as that was just unspeakable. So I, how long it lasted, probably. I and mean, I worked there for about two months before we went to India, and I think it carried on for not that much longer. And in the end, they sort of had to give the clothes away. It was, it was, um, it had last. That was it. Its, its lifespan was not that great. I love the fact that they just gave the clothes away <laughs> at the end because that's very altruistic. But I would imagine yeah. that. You and know, the thing is with that shop is that it represented what we were all feeling, what we were thinking. Because I remember journalists would come and interview me and ask me, well, what, do, what does it mean? You know, why do you have these posters of G the Ganesha and, you know, all these wonderful Hindu gods and goddesses? And, you know, so it was like it was representing our philosophy. Meanwhile, back in London, when the Beatles opened a shop in Baker Street, jewelry, paintings and hippie clothes, as well as furniture. 
you've titled your book after the song Jennifer Juniper by Donovan, and as you explain in the book, you were the inspiration for that song, the muse, uh, if you like, although you and Donovan did not have a romantic relationship, right? No, I think, um, because it was while I was working at Apple that he sort of, he arrived and didn't realize I was there. I'd met him once before with Patty and George, and and um, and so he uh, wanted me to have photographs of me on his album, the previous album. So we all went to Cornwall and dressed up like, you know, in kind of um, hippie gear mm-hmm. and um, skipping around the sands and the dunes and everything. And uh, there's a little movie of it. And then, um, and then after that, he said he had a song he'd written for me. And uh, he, you know, would I like to come to his manager's house? And so he played, got his guitar and sang this really lovely song and i was quite shy in those days and didn't quite know where to look <laughs> and um and realized it was a kind of it was a declaration of love but it was so beautiful and so innocent and when i hear that song today it just reminds me of that innocent you know very uh, idealistic time well, everything worked out because I think Donovan got married shortly after that. So that's right. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He found it was, his, sweet. it was court. It was what they call courtly love. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you mentioned going to India with the Beatles to study transcendental meditation with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Was that the catalyst for you leaving your modeling career? Because you left modeling right around the same time you got into TM. Yeah, no, I think the catalyst for me was what I called a sort of spiritual awakening. And I was still only 19, I think, 18, 19. And I just saw, you know, I just, um, I don't know, it was like having all these aha moments all in one go, all hitting at the same time. And um, just my life changed then. I sort of felt I was looking or seeking for some sense of meaning in life. And it was strange because, you know, I would continue to model, but then a friend of mine said, oh, I'm, I'm opening a shop in San Francisco, American friend, and uh, would you like to come over? And um, I just did. I had enough money for either three months rent on my apartment or a one-way ticket to San Francisco. So um, I went. And the extraordinary thing was that so many people, I bumped right into that counterculture, were experiencing the same thing that I'd experienced when I was in London. And so it's sort of like being taken, it is like being taken on a journey. Suddenly everything's very different. And then going to India after that was all part of that. And after that, modeling didn't do it for me. I was searching for something that had more, more meaning to me. I think about what was happening in uh, Europe and then what was happening in America. And there was a kind of global consciousness, I guess you could say, because the communication wasn't there like it is today. Although I suppose um, records going back and forth between (laughs) continents was like an early form of the Internet. It was a way of communicating these ideas. Absolutely. I mean, the musicians were uh, the torchbearers, you know, and they were the ones. They were, you know, like all artists, they kind of could feel what the zeitgeist was, the way it was moving, and they represented what we were all feeling and thinking. There have been a number of people over the years who weren't <laughs> in India uh, with the Beatles who talk about that time period and the group's interest in TM and say that George really took it seriously, but maybe the other Beatles less so? I think John took it seriously, too. Mm, okay. I really do. I think George was the first one, and he was the instigator in many ways. But, um, but John really got into it and put his trust into it as well. And, uh, you know, we all meditated, sometimes for hours on end, sometimes days on end. Um, but uh, it was partly that that was just fantastic. But it was also, we had our own bungalow, and so it was such a treat in a way to be able to go and sit on the top uh, on the roof of our bungalow in the sunshine and there would be john and george and paul um just playing their guitars and just making up songs and you know whether it's john saying he couldn't sleep last night or whether it was dear prudence or whatever you know it was witnessing all of that was um was, was very special
Does that ashram still exist? No, it crumbled and became part of a forest. Oh. But now they're trying to um, regenerate it and uh, create the gardens. And I know, I know people, because I was asked to go, but I, I didn't go, uh, who've gone over there. And um, I think they're trying to recreate it as how it was. That would be wonderful. What a nice spiritual retreat yeah. that would be for people. Yeah. But I know yeah. from, from I, I don't know much about TM, but I do know that one doesn't have to be in a setting like that. You can be in your bedroom uh, right. and also uh, meditating. And, and do you still do it to this day? Yeah, I still meditate, but I don't do the transcendental meditation anymore. But I've, I've continued to meditate. And I know I don't I don't know if I want to get into this <laughs> really, but I know that there, I know that there was some concern over the Maharishi. Uh, maybe going into it, people thought he didn't have human failings, but evidently he did. Yes, I think that's true, and I think also that there was some you know there was a troublemaker amongst us too that was kind of pushing that. Mm. Um, but I think. We were very naive, you know, we were very new to all that side of things. And in a way, it was a shame it ended like that. Although Patty George and I went on to South India and hooked up with Ravi Shankar and um, toured with him for a while, which was fantastic. Um, but I know, for me personally, when I came back to London and heard that he was going to be in Bangor in Wales again, I made an effort to go and see him and just say how sorry I was that it but it ended like that. And I know over the years, George and I know John and probably the others all made their peace with him. We've talked a lot today about the Beatles and, and Donovan, but as I mentioned earlier, you were married to Mick Fleetwood for a, a number of years, and mm -hmm. you met him through Roger Waters. Again, people are going to listen to this and no, go, No, no, that's so funny, because I did this interview for the Daily Mail here in England, and the interview was, you know, probably like a couple of weeks, two, three weeks before, and I, before, uh, when I was 16, I met Mick when I was 16, but instead of going out with him, because my, my best friend had a bit of a crush on him, so I, I knew he liked me, but I didn't want to go on that one. So I went out with, he was the singer in this band called The Shanes that Mick was in. His name was Roger, and I didn't use his surname because <clears throat> I didn't really need to. He's not part of the story, really. Mm -hmm. And um, the Daily Mail just put it into their heads say it was Roger Waters. <laughs> I mean, where does that come from? And I, I was tempted to, call, to email the interviewer and say, where did that come from? And why would you think it was Roger Waters when I was 16? <laughs> <laughs> so I know now that, that I'm gonna, that's going to keep coming up. It is. Um, <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. I made a note of it too. I said I never heard this I before. I read well, that. Well, the funny thing is, the funny thing is, the Daily Express did an interview as well, and she emailed me originally and said, oh, "You didn't tell me that you went out with Roger Waters." And I said, "Well, I didn't." <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> I know. That's but how anyway, these things it's start. A good, it's a good talking point. Yeah, that's how these things mm -hmm. start. Unfortunately, it'll be in someone's book in a few years. <laughs> it will. Yeah. It will. Yeah, but your current husband has no connection whatsoever to that world of music. No, it was such a relief. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, he's an architect, and um, you know he's a really, really good architect, and um, he loves classical music. Hmm. And I've introduced him to some of my music. We've been chatting with Jenny Boyd today on the Vintage Rock and Pop Shop. Once again, the book is called Jennifer Juniper, A Journey Beyond the Muse. And Jenny, thank you so much for being on the show. And it was a pleasure speaking with you and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. And you too.